Sejam muito bem-vindos a mais um videocast especial, diretamente da terceira conferência de Escola Austríaca, realizada em São Paulo, na Fê Comércio. Meu nome é Bruno Garchag e eu sou podcaster do Instituto Ludwig von Mises Brasil. Hoje nós temos o prazer de entrevistar Mr. Peter Schiff, que é investidor, autor e comentarista financeiro nos Estados Unidos, além de CEO e estrategista-chefe global da Aero Pacific Capital. Uh, Mr. Peter Schiff uh, ficou muito conhecido, ganhou popularidade entre 2008 e 2009 através de um vídeo no YouTube intitulado Peter Schiff Estava Certo. O vídeo consiste de uma compilação de clipes de suas várias aparições em programas econômicos, a maioria entre 2005 e 2007, em que ele explica os problemas fundamentais da economia mundial e alerta sobre o colapso que estava por vir. Obrigado uh, muito uh, por vir e bem-vindos ao Brasil. Eu gostaria de perguntar um, ask you, you became famous uh, to predict the housing bubble in USA. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, the bad incentives and bad decisions that, that create the problem were modified or is there a risk of a new bubble in the, in the future? Well, I think we already have a bubble. It's not really in an asset per se like housing or stocks, it's in government. I think that the Fed is now fueling a, a bubble in government itself you look at the government bond market or the treasury market, uh, you can see the bubble there uh, because bond prices are ridiculously high, the yields are very low by you know, any kind of realistic measurement. And the ability of the government to finance spending through the Federal Reserve has resulted in an enormous explosion in government spending. And I think that is the bubble that is fueling the economy right now. It's, it's, it's government. But ultimately, this bubble is going to burst as well when interest rates rise. And I think more problematically, though, for the economy is we don't get any benefit from a government bubble. Now, at least we got houses out of the housing bubble. Maybe we got too many of them, but you can use them for something. Uh, we're getting you know, nothing out of all this government. In fact, it's, we're getting less than nothing. It's interfering with the ability of the free market to restructure the economy. So by growing our government, we're growing our problems. And ultimately, I think the next collapse is going to be much worse because of all the things that we've done uh, to delay the day of reckoning. Okay. Uh, I'm in this interview also with the president of the Instituto Ludwig von Mises Brasil, Elio Beltran, and with the editor of the site, Leandro Roque, for whom I'll pass the word to make the next question. Yes, yeah, Mr. Schiff, I'd like to ask you a question about interest rates. Uh, some free market economists are saying that even if the Fed wanted to raise the Fed funds rate, it cannot do it because of the excess reserves. Like since the Fed funds rate, since the Fed fund rates, the Fed funds rate is the rate that the banks charge each other in the interbank market. Uh, and since they are, they have excess reserves, so they are not l loaning, and they are not demanding money. So they said that because of these excess reserves, they cannot, the Fed cannot raise rates, even if you well, are in charge. So is that correct? I or it doesn't make any sense to me. The Fed can raise the discount rate whenever it wants, uh, and also it can, you know, stop buying. Uh, treasuries or it can start selling down its holding of treasuries. Mm -hmm. So the Fed can do a lot to move rates higher or to shrink money supply if it wanted to. The problem is it doesn't want to. It wants to sustain the bubble. It doesn't want to do anything to deflate it. Uh, you know, just the same way the housing bubble. When the housing bubble was, was inflating, the Fed knew there was a housing bubble, but they didn't care because they didn't want to do anything about it because they knew that the housing bubble was fueling the whole economy. Mm -hmm. So the Fed went out of its way for years and years to deny the bubble existed, simply because they, they wanted it to keep growing. Uh, and so, you know, they do the same thing now. Uh, they, they realize that there's a bubble, uh, but they deny there's inflation because they don't want to raise rates because they know the consequences will be horrific. And when you believe in a bond bubble right now? Of course there's a, there's a bubble. I just said there's a bubble in the government, so there's a bubble in the government bond market. But interest rates are going to have to rise. And when they do, I mean, the losses will be horrific. We just saw this $2 billion loss at J.P. Morgan. That's nothing compared to what the banks would lose if interest rates actually went up to where they need to be. And I think the Federal Reserve knows how vulnerable the banks are. That's why the stress test that they just did recently only looked at a big drop in stock prices or real estate prices. They didn't stress test a big drop mm -hmm. in the bond market, which is the real risk. And of course, government finances itself, the government needs low interest rates to service the debt. Yep. If interest rates go up, 
you know, we're in the same position as Greece. And, you know, we're going to have to ask our creditors to take a haircut. Uh, otherwise, you know, we'll have to default. You know? uh -huh. Well, the, the reason is that these free market economists are saying that the Fed cannot drain all these excess reserves from the banking system. And if it, if it cannot do that right now, so they, they cannot... Whoa. It raise interest rates. It can do it. It just would cause a lot of damage. Yeah. You know, but I mean, they, yeah. they, they could do it. But can you picture this? To do it, can though. you picture them them doing it? They'll have to. Well, do it I don't right think they're going to do it until they feel that they have no choice. Uh -huh. uh, so, as you know, as long as they can postpone the consequences, they'll do it. So I think they're going to resist it as long as possible. But you know, the, it's it's a dangerous game, a monetary chicken. You know, the longer they resist it the harder ultimately decision is to do the right thing because it just makes it so much worse because you've allowed the problem to get so much bigger and, and therefore solving it is, is more painful. You know, if you're worried about the short-term pain, well, the longer you wait you know, to swallow the medicine, the more painful it is on the way down. Peter, uh, I'd like to ask you a question uh, of a more pragmatic nature. A lot of uh, people that follow us from our audience are worried today about what they should be doing with their savings. And uh, we, I think most Austrians would agree that uh, we will have a, a coming collapse that is getting bigger and bigger. The, the big question is the timing of it. So uh, what do you think that you know, the average person that has some savings should be doing over the next uh, one year, two years? Which asset classes, what sort of investments they should be looking at? I, I, think that, I think savings, to the extent that you want liquidity and just savings, I think it should be in gold. I think you know. You, you, I think that currencies offer uh, very little in, in the way of maintaining their purchasing power. But if you want to have some foreign exchange in addition to gold, you know, look at the currencies that have the least bad monetary policy, where they have higher interest rates and they have uh, a more independent central bank, where they have trade surpluses, budgets in balance, things like that, and you can hold some of those. But any particular country? You well, there are a lot of currencies that we look at. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Scandinavia, Norway, Sweden, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Chinese RMB. Uh, there are currencies that, that, that you can own, um, you know, to get you know, other than other than other than dollars. But for investments, if you have an Austrian uh, perspective and you understand what really generates economic growth and wealth, you want to invest in assets or businesses in countries that are going to see a net increase in, in, in wealth creation and higher living standards. And, so and you so, mean stocks? Well, yeah, well, well stocks, and, but you know, the, the, the businesses that are located in, in countries where you're going to see a, an increase in standards of living. And you know, I think that th what's going to redefine this part of the 21st century is going to be a, a major realignment in global living standards. I think that the wealthier Western nations are, are going to see uh, big reductions in their relative living standards. And I think a lot of the uh, Southeast Asian economies or the so-called emerging markets are going to start to command a greater share of world output especially since uh, they are uh, disproportionately uh, contributing to it. So I think the countries that have been saving the most, that have been producing the most, are going to emerge as much bigger consumers of the end products rather than the developed world that has been borrowing to consume those products. So I think if you understand how it's going to realign, uh, you can invest. And then, you know, when you're looking around the emerging markets and you want to figure out, you know, where should I concentrate? Look for the countries that have the smallest government interference in the economy, that have the fewest regulations, uh, the lowest taxes, uh, the smallest government spending as a share of GDP, uh, where the labor markets are freest, uh, you know, where capital is free uh, to you know go to its highest and best use, and you know, where you have all you know all the free market conditions, or at least you know nobody is a a, a pure you know uh, free market anymore. It's all degree. You know, I don't think any of the countries around today are America in the 19th century. Uh, but there, are, you know, there are a lot of countries that are closer to what America used to be than, than what America is today. So you, you know, look for those countries, and I think there's a lot of opportunity. But you know, you got to be a long-term investor for the stocks because you know, you never know a short run. And, and and politicians do pretty stupid things, and so uh, you know, you got you got to be able to ride that out.
Uh, yeah, I'd like uh, one more uh, theoretical question. I know your, your position on fractional reserve banking. I know you're for it. Uh, you, uh, I know you, you would also abolish the federal deposit insurance and also the, the central bank. But is that only it? I mean, if you do these two things, then you think it's well, going to be safe? I mean, I, I'm in favor of fractional reserve banking as long as it's a function of the free market. Uh -huh. So as long as you don't have government involvement to guarantee a bank deposits, uh, then bankers know that you know, to the extent that they don't have adequate reserves, they run the risk of a run on their bank. They run the risk of destroying their reputation. Uh, so I think in a free market, banks will compete with one another and they will strike a balance, banks will strike a balance between a desire to maximize profits on loans versus the ability to satisfy their depositors, that their deposits are there and available uh, when they need them. Uh, you know, the problem comes in when you have the government coming in and, and guaranteeing the deposits, and so now the banks are free to have tiny reserves, uh, and, and you have much more speculation and a much less, you know, stable banking system that is prone to big failures and then moral hazards and bailouts and losses. And, you know, the irony of it is the government says that if it wasn't for the government, we'd have all these, you know, instabilities and, and big bank runs and losses. And so we need the government to come in. And the government comes in and, 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 and basically creates all the problems that they were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And they take an inherently stable situation and destabilize it. And they, and they actually encourage more. Would favor uh, competition between also uh, state currencies, like the Swiss franc being used in the US, oh, yeah. the euro, I mean, yeah, I mean, as a transition? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the best look, look at how many people in uh, Latin America use dollars yeah. or, you know, I, I think you know, they should they should switch again. They shouldn't <laughs> use dollars. But because people didn't trust, you know, other currencies down here, they didn't trust the peso, they didn't trust the real, uh, you know, they wanted where do they keep their savings. You know, they, they kept them in dollars uh -huh. um, and, you know, they should keep it in gold or, you know, or other currencies are, are preferable to the dollar. But unfortunately, you've got a race to the bottom right now with a lot of currencies. Everybody wants the debase. And so there's really no safe haven in paper. You know, the only, the only money that can't be debased is gold because they can't print it. They have to mine it, and it's expensive. It's, you, know, it's, you know, it's hard to get gold out of the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And, and regarding this these subject, uh, what, is your what is your position on this uh, e-currencies, e these electronic currencies they make, like computer managed? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I'm a little skeptical there to try to, you know, because, again, I mean, how is that? You know, that's it's just they have computer. an algorithm. They say there is a limit; they can't uh, surpass it. So yeah, in, the, in the in the future, there will be a fixed amount of money. But but it's only electronic. No, but there's still there's no intrinsic value there. Yeah. I mean, what gives what makes gold money is that you can't only just use it as a medium of exchange. You can actually use the gold. That okay. it has it has its own physical properties that make it desirable, not just as money. I think it's important that money be a commodity, that it actually have value in and of itself, not simply be valued as money, but have intrinsic value. And, and, and so if you're just talking about putting your faith in some computer algorithm, all right, well, what can I do with that computer algorithm? If I can't spend it, what am I going to do with it? What, what, what ultimately gives it value? And if there's no value there, I just wouldn't have any faith in it. I don't have any more faith in that than paper. <laughs> well, they say that the value ultimately will be given by the fixed amount of it. Yeah, but, but there's it's a, fixed, it's a fixed amount of nothing. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I mean, it's, no matter how much I have, I can't do anything with it, right? At least if I have gold, I can make jewelry out of it, or I could use it in, you know, you can use gold in, you know, electronics or in, you know, there, 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 there's value. It's a, it's a very, it has a lot of uh, unique and special properties uh, that, that give it value because there's a lot of uses for gold. Now, most people don't use gold for those things because there are other metals that are less expensive, but you could use gold, uh -huh. you know, and uh, so, yeah. And one last question. Uh, do you, can you picture the world, at least the United States, uh, coming back to the gold standard or at least the silver standard? Absolutely. So, really? It's harder to picture it not happening. Really? I mean, I think that if you go over modern history uh -huh. um, and you look at periods of time where paper is money versus gold, uh, paper is in the minority. And it's been tried. It's been tried many times and it's always failed. Yeah. And, you know, and, and after it fails, you know, you learn your lesson and you go back to gold. 
and it takes a while for generations to pass and people forget what their grandparents learned and they repeat the same mistakes. Uh -huh. uh, but I think it's a lot easier to go, f to go from a gold money to paper than to go, I mean, I think it's easier to go from paper to gold than okay. gold to paper because you're, you're asking your citizens, when you're on a gold center, you've got to fool your citizens to give up something of value for something of no value. It seems to me that it's easier to say, okay, we ha our money has no value now so we're going to replace it with money that has value. And that's like, it seems like a positive move, you know, especially if you do it, you know, when, when you have chaos and you have runaway yeah. inflation and you're looking for a solution. Okay, but then you think they're going to do it, the governments are going to do it in an act of desperation? Like, it, well, it, the gold <laughs> standard puts a constraint on the government, so... Yes, the it, governments never want a gold standard. Yeah. It has to be imposed upon them by the people. Uh, because, no, it's like... You know, at, at, at the high school prom, nobody wants a chaperone. They just assume, you know, have no adults there. Yeah. But, you know, the adults know better, so there's chaperones. You know, so we, we need to chaperone politicians. They need, they, they need to be reined in. Uh, they need discipline. They don't have it when there's paper. They have it when there's gold. So, you know, you, the, the public needs to be willing to rein them in. And they usually do that once they understand how much damage the government has done. And so once they totally wreck an economy and the people realize that it's wrecked and how it got that way, you know, then, you know, they can go back on a gold standard. And you're a true believer that this is going to happen. It's going to happen eventually, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, would you like some last word about your bank that you were opening and well, I mentioned, the Brazilians? Yeah, for anybody, I think it's, you know, I think the more people open up an account with me and start using gold and silver, we put more pressure on these politicians. <laughs> Uh, to, to, you know, to adopt the gold standard or to refrain from printing too much money. Because if everybody opens up an account at my bank and is, you know, they're holding their gold, you know, if the politicians, you know, the, the, the paper money loses value yeah. if nobody wants it. You want, and you want if no one wants to hold it and if you go into a store and someone says, no, we don't take paper money anymore, well, we'll, we'll take Peter's Euro Pacific gold card if you want to buy my products, you know, Great. so they'll be forced to, to, to be responsible. And the website? <clears throat> oh, the, at, at europacbank.com, E-U-R-O-P-A-C-B-A-N-K.com. All right, yeah. Mr. Schiff, thank you very much for your yeah, time. Sure. Very nice talking sure. to you. Okay, thank you very much for sure. this interview. Estivemos aqui hoje conversando com Mr. Peter Schiff, junto com Leandro Roque e Hélio Beltrão, do Instituto Odivigo Vamos do Brasil. Muito obrigado.